um, to confirm that you're in the right session. We are uh, the housing strategy session and um, we have representatives from the Atlanta Regional Commission and the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission as well as um, Carly Booz with the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. Um, for today's session, you are able to um, get continuing education credits through the American Planning Association or AIA. And for those who are self-reporting engineers, MORPC is able to provide you with a certificate. Just reach out if you need that. Um, in honor of being remote and virtual and relying on technology to, to share ideas and conversation today, we'd encourage you to take advantage of social media. Um, just use Pound MORPC Summit to post your ideas and engage in conversation throughout the session. Um, I'm Patty Huddle. So I'm the Vice President of the F Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority. I uh, just joined this team in May of this year and for the prior nine years had been with One Columbus, um, formerly known as uh, Columbus 2020. And we served as the regional or we, it does serve as the regional economic development organization for the Columbus region. Um, I have a 25 year career in economic development and um, also worked in the private sector here in the Columbus market prior to uh, diving into the economic development arena. So clearly based on those stats, I've been around a while. And um, I remember participating in the first summit on sustainability and it struck me as I was preparing for my remarks. Um, I don't really recall housing being a discussion other than, than green housing. So sustainability in that manner. Um, and today, as we know, housing is the number one topic in, in many, if not all, communities. So we're very pleased as an organization to sponsor today's regional housing strategy session uh, because of the importance of the topic, but also because as an organization that has historically provided financing for economic and community development, we're trying to figure out if we too can play a role to try to address the challenges that our communities are facing in this space. Um, the Atlanta and Columbus regions have the common fortune and challenge of projected historic growth. The opportunity presented by growth is increased prosperity. A challenge, which we will discuss today, is the increasing gap in available affordable housing. In both communities, regional planning organizations have stepped to the forefront to develop stakeholder-driven regional housing strategies, which include investment and policy recommendations to ensure current and future residents have access to housing in the neighborhoods of their choice. Today, we'll have presentations from both the Atlanta Regional Commission, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, providing insights on their strategy and processes and findings. We'll then move to a panel discussion and Q&A. And you're encouraged to participate through the chat feature. Jennifer Knoll with Morpsey is um, assisting with the session today and she'll be managing uh, the chat for us. Today's presenters are Marissa Ghani, Senior Planner with Atlanta Regional Commission, Liz Whelan, Data Manager with Morpsey, and then when we move to the panel discussion, Carly Booz, Executive Director of the Affordable Housing of Central Ohio, will join the discussion. I missed a word there, the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Marissa Ghani, Atlanta Regional Commission. Marissa is responsible for leading the regional housing policy work and secondarily, transit-oriented development, clearly interrelated topics. She serves as a liaison to state, local, and nonprofit housing related organizations. And with that, Marissa, we're interested in your remarks. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. And Patty, thank you for introduction. Um, I appreciate getting to speak to everybody uh, in Ohio, and I'm sure there's some Atlanta colleagues on here as well. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining this conversation. I look forward to your questions and comments. Please ask them, as Patty said, along in the chat box, and hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them and we can have an engaging conversation. So 
Um, <clears throat> Uh, I am Marissa Ghani with the Atlanta Regional Commission. I work in the Community Development Group and lead our housing work. Today, I'm going to speak to you about the organization's approach to provide a framework for regional housing. Can you please go back to the first slide? Thank you. Um, the Atlanta Regional Commission has long been a leader of the region's response to housing issues, providing data and analytics, planning, and technical assistance to local governments. In 2019, ARC, along with many regional partners, developed the Metro Atlanta Housing Strategy. ARC has developed the strategy to provide regional leadership in addressing our housing challenges, engage a broad group of stakeholders, and to promote further discussion and implementation of housing strategies around the region. Our intent is to foster a balanced mix of housing throughout the region to serve current and future populations, to remain co economically competitive, and to enhance the livability of our region. Next slide, please. From calls for assistance from partners and stakeholders at the end of 2017, ARC developed a plan to more actively address our region's housing issues by gathering a number of working groups to provide a space for collaborative work and thoughtful partnership. In addition, ARC's regional economic development plan, known as Catalyst, identified healthy housing as a priority for Metro Atlanta to remain economically competitive providing a platform for additional perspectives and stakeholders to be involved in addressing this issue. Next slide. Adopt, um, <clears throat> adopting a framework from uh, Atlanta's Urban Land Institute, ULI, Affordable Atlanta Report, which if you all uh, have not taken a look at it, please do. ARC started the process to develop a regional housing strategy for the 10 core, core counties. Throughout the process, we wanted to have continued engagement to ensure regional ownership and conversation. We must have engaged, I wanna say over 600 different people throughout this process um, through various mechanisms of engagement, whether it be focus groups or open houses or um, work sessions, uh, going to different meetings to present. So we really just wanted to make sure that everybody knew what we were doing and everybody had a voice in the discussion so that they felt like they were a part of that um, uh, the product that came out of it. Next slide, please. The strategy is data-driven, strategic regional approach. So acknowledging that this is a complicated issue, in the beginning of this process, we identified six broad factors that if the region made progress towards would improve our regional housing issues. These six broad factors will be used for two things, to measure our success by literally producing performance measures, and to connect what we learned through data through the submarket analysis to how our various counties and municipal partners, partners can strategize and plan to address housing issues. So that's our housing strategies. So you'll see later we have developed um, submarkets. What I'm trying to say in this paragraph is we've de de developed the submarket analysis, and then those submarkets are tied to policy strategies that we're hoping those are uh, a menu of options for local governments to be able to undertake. Next slide, please. In order to identify what was taking place on the ground in our community, uh, communities, we identified submarkets based on housing characteristics such as average sales price, age, type, and size. We really wanted this to be the submarkets to be granular enough that it made sense for what's happening, but broad enough that it could be applied regionally, and then also easily understandable. That we wanted, we knew that you know probably the average person is not going to be understanding what the submarket is, but we're hoping that the elected officials and the people who are dealing with these issues would understand um, how we came to the decision about these submarkets. So, the analysis revealed ten distinct submarkets across the region that share common issues. The submarkets range from high price to low price and are distinct by geography. So there's four urban, four suburban, and two rural. And really, uh, we wanted. If you want to go back to the idea of our stakeholder engagement piece, we vetted these submarkets with several of our working groups and our focus groups. When we did it just from a data perspective, we had seven submarkets, and we heard that that wasn't um, granular enough for on the ground conversations. Then we had 12, and that was too much. And so we finally landed at 10, which was when we really factored in how our policy priorities would change by each market. So we wanted to ensure that. If we're saying that this is a, a different market, it's because it has a different policy priority um, that, that the jurisdiction should be concentrating on to 
move in whatever direction made sense. So next, next slide. So to roll out the tool, we created an interactive tool at metroatlhousing.org. There's a big search bar to type in the community's name and easily find the community information. If you go, um, next slide, please. This is what pops up right when you enter in your community. It says this is the submarket map and it's clickable. It provides quick information. You could see that information at the regional, county, or city scale. Keep going. Yep. And then when you click on a county or a city, it provides even uh, more information, whether it's a market snapshot. Um, it shows you how your jurisdiction is right there. That's fine. And then our submarket page. So if you're if you're a jurisdiction and you click on, oh, you say like, I am all of submarket seven, and I could click on submarket seven um, and see more in depth, like, what does that mean? What does the data mean? What are the top priorities? Uh, they really provide the detail to be designated in that area and what the top priorities, policy priorities for a community to start thinking about are. Go ahead. So if you remember those factors we identified in the beginning of the process, it truly was the framework we used throughout this to have discussions about what the solution should be and what the potential of the solutions are. Um, so you'll see here, in order to make progress towards those factors, we needed to identify ways and policies to do so. So since our local governments are so different, we wanted to provide a true menu of options a local government and other stakeholders could undertake to start making small steps towards progress. And go ahead, one more, next slide. Each factor has over 25 policies listed to start the journey towards making progress. And um, it has, I would say, over 200 different policies within that, those different separate or, um, um, titles. So I, I mean, I, we, have, we did research on trying to find every different way of thinking about how do you increase supply, right? And then how do you, uh, increase our financial opportunities. So I encourage everybody to go take a look at those solutions and maybe some of them will work for you. But the idea is that um, there are different options for different locations depending on what is politically possible in that location. And then next slide. For our data nerds, we developed the Data Explorer with over 150 data factors pertaining to just housing. Um, these data points can be viewed by census track level, and you could view, uh, you know, like what's happening in terms of uh, the gradient of the scale. It's really an amazing tool as well. And we're continuing to expand this tool. Go ahead, next one. So ARC continues to expand our current responsibilities related to housing, primarily including planning, data analysis, convening, coordinating. I have to say through this virtual um, platform, we've had amazing response to all of the resources and convening that we've done within using Zoom or, or uh, the virtual platform. We've had over 600 people coming to meetings that usually had 200 people or over 100 people coming to meetings that usually had 40 people. So it's been really, uh, it's been beneficial for us to have these housing conversations that happen around the region. We're really getting to be able to be regional. Um, and as our commitment to the work, ARC is going to identify several steps that we can take to further integrate regional housing goals into our organization, either by funding support, technical assistance, government affairs work. Um, and at the beginning of next year, we'll be evolving the website to become more than just a data tool that you see there, and instead really be a central resource for housing. We're hoping a lot of the communications around housing happens there, right? So whether it's events or whether it's blogs or whether it's people just having a discussion about what are the solutions that we could be talking about. Um, so we're really excited for what that that next phase is. And then and that I think I don't th I think that was my last slide. Yep. So if you all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or we could have it. Um, I'll answer them during the panel. Great, thank you. Sorry, I was struggling to uh, get my video back on there. Um, so now we're going to uh, move on to our next speaker, which is Liz Whalen. And uh, Liz is the data manager for Morpsey's data and mapping department. Um, her work contemplates the demographic, social, and economic factors that drive change. These data insights inform emergent issues such as housing, multimodal transportation, 
land use and development in the Columbus region. And with that, Liz. Thanks so much, Patty, for the introduction. Um, I just want to start out by saying, uh, well, first, good morning, and thanks to all of you for being here and being a part of this conversation, but also um, just to recognize uh, how, how valuable uh, and important it's been to have ARC as um, a, a model and a guide with them being, you know, a few steps ahead of us on their regional housing strategy efforts. And we've really appreciated the conversations that we've had the opportunity to have with staff at ARC throughout this journey um, and are always kind of looking, looking to them to see uh, what great tools and resources they're putting out and, and trying to learn as many lessons as we can from you all along the way. So we greatly appreciate the opportunity to collaborate on this uh, throughout the process. Um, so uh, with that, I just wanna uh, give a little overview about the uh, work and some of the findings with the MORPC regional housing strategy. Uh, some as you, uh, some of you may know, we had a large virtual event with about 200 community members. That was about a month back to share the findings and kick off what we think is the real hard work of implementation that the region has ahead of us. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so when the regional housing strategy kicked off about a year ago, its state of purpose originally was to create a coordinated housing strategy for Central Ohio that provides investment and policy recommendations to support our communities and our growing population. But we just so happen to be doing this work at a really critical time. Uh, COVID-19 radically altered public and private resources and that shined a bright light on the social, social justice and racial inequality challenges that we were already experiencing in Central Ohio. Uh, so this presented an opportunity for the regional housing strategy. So we were able to pivot with our stakeholders to address these disparities through maybe even a stronger equity and recovery lens. Through the process, stakeholders told us that they envision a future for Central Ohio where growth and recovery help us to realize more equity among Central Ohioans and not less. Housing, where it's built or maintained, who it's for and how it's priced can be a platform to achieve this vision. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so MORPC served as the project coordinator and provided staff support throughout the development of the regional housing strategy. And we were also fortunate enough to work with an excellent consultant team that was led by enterprise community partners who are nationally known for their work in housing, particularly affordable housing as well as with some local partners who helped us with the housing finance side, market analysis, and public engagement. Equally important to this process was the role of our stakeholders and community leaders. Uh, between the project sponsors and advisory board, the regional housing strategy was guided by nearly 100 regional leaders representing over 50 organizations across public, private, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors. We also heard from many others throughout the process via surveys, workshops, and interviews. Next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit of context and reminder that uh, this is a regional housing strategy. So we're really taking a regional approach to the work. The main area of our study was the seven county region that you see highlighted in red. Um, but since data can be finicky, we also sometimes relied on data for the Columbus MSA, which is that slightly larger yellow boundary when we were looking at some of the more detailed historic trends. Um, but we also know that community needs and opportunities look very different from Columbus than they do in, say, Marysville or London or Newark or Grove City or even uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood within our region's communities. So we're also taking a close look at the unique market conditions and context of communities across the region to determine where strategies may make the most sense to start or scale. I'll share a little more detail about that in the next slide. Um, so this was a very data intensive pro process. We conducted a thorough review of recent housing analyses uh, that were developed by many of our partners in the region. We summarized the key findings and recommendations from those. We also looked at cross sections of the data um, at our regional level uh, to understand those broad regional housing market trends. And finally, we explored the data through a more focused geographic lens at the census tract level. And that's to help us paint a picture of the variable housing needs and market conditions from place to place throughout central Ohio. Um, for example, we conducted a submarket analysis um, uh, and, you know, we learned a lot from our partners at ARC on that. 
Um, and that helps us to paint a picture of areas that have greatest similarity in terms of an area's physical characteristics, housing stock, and housing markets so that we could target those strategies to areas where they make the most sense. Uh, we also uh, conducted analysis that identifies areas that are most vulnerable to housing market gentrification and risk of displacement of residents as market conditions change in those neighborhoods. And finally, we worked with uh, the Ohio State University's Kerwin Institute um, and their opportunity mapping analysis to evaluate 15 indicators of opportunity across transportation, housing, education, um, health, and employment. And that's including things like the presence of high quality childcare or entry level jobs. Um, so through the housing lens, we know uh, that there is the potential to initiate actions that are inclusive and considerate of residents varying access to opportunity. So it was really important that we were able to um, slice and dice the data, not only in, in terms of uh, the types of variables and information we were looking at, but from place to place within the region. And the next slide, please. All right, so um, as our team studied existing conditions and pooled in data from other reports, what emerged were these five core regional housing issues. Uh, these core issues built the framework for the regional housing strategy in ways that you'll see as we continue on in this, in this conversation. Um, so while we consider these issues separately to help our understanding for the strategy, it's important to keep in mind that they have tremendous overlap. It'll be really important to see efforts on all fronts, to see real, real progress on our housing, housing goals. Um, quickly, I'll run through the issues. First, we have increased competition for homes, uh, which is driven by increased population growth, a low rate of housing production, as well as the lasting impacts from the Great Recession. Next, barriers limiting access to homes, including disparities in lending practices, creditworthiness, housing instability, and housing discrimination. Third, we have a limited supply of housing homes priced for low-income households. As more homes are built for higher price points, the region is losing affordable single-family rentals, and demand for rental assistance outweighs supply. And then fourth, we have demand for more diverse housing stocks and stock, and that is homes that can serve a wide range of ages, abilities, and household size, sizes to meet the circumstances um, that, that all residents have throughout the region. And then finally, housing instability among Central Highlands, which is reflected primarily by cost burden rates, uh, as well as uh, evictions, homelessness, and homes in need of repair. Um, and it's worth noting that these issues were identified pre-COVID-19. Uh, now, in this new reality, COVID and the racial, health, and economic disparities it has highlighted only serve to add urgency to these issues. We've been able to evaluate them through the lens of equitable and sustainable recovery with the help of our stakeholders. And the next slide, please. Um, and actually, maybe for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these next couple of slides, but um, just to highlight some of the key findings. Uh, for instance, um, that we know there are 100,000 homes in Central Ohio, and this was pre-pandemic, who were spending more than 50% of their income on housing. Um, we've also learned things like renter households are twice as likely to be cost burdened than owner households, and uh, that, and very importantly, that low to middle income households, which are disproportionately households headed by people of color, are about nine times as likely to be cost burden than higher earner, earners. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, I'll try to quickly go through a couple of these highlights um, that I know are very important findings, um, which we can, you can find more about on our website. Um, we also know, of course, that evictions um, are an even greater concern than ever as households are impacted by COVID-19. Uh, even before the pandemic evictions, uh, which is a critical barrier for residents seeking housing once it's happened to them, uh, was a real problem in central Ohio. Uh, we know, for instance, that in 2016, about 35 renter households lost their homes to eviction every single day. Next slide, please. And then, of course, we have to dispel the myth that we can just build our way out of the housing crisis. Unfortunately, it's not that simple, but more housing is part of the solution, and we need more housing, more, but also more diversity of housing options. Unfortunately, our region, like the rest of the nation, has experienced very low housing production relative to population growth. 
In the 2000s, only one housing unit was built for every two new residents in the region. Um, I'm sorry, I should, have, uh, I should say that one housing unit was built for every two new residents, whereas in the 2010s, only one housing unit was built for every three new residents. Um, so for the first time, we're building at, at a deficit in central Ohio. Um, so it's, it's important that we don't ignore that production challenge. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so final, uh, I'll, I'll close with um, a summary of some of the important work that our partners uh, contributed to, and that was to take all of the over 100 actions that were identified through our housing strategy and try to identify where should we start, where do we begin. Um, and so through some of those collaborative efforts, we were able to identify uh, five priorities, uh, which are listed here on the screen. Um, and in terms of next steps, we are looking to initiate these five housing strategy priorities. Uh, we know that they won't all be led by MORPSI uh, because we know that there are better and more knowledgeable organizations that can help to lead those, uh, but we are ready to facilitate and, and kick them off and continue to carry this conversation forward. And just a couple of other slides just to quickly wrap up here um, for the next one. Our immediate next step at MORPSI is working with cities, villages, townships, and counties to create local housing action agendas. Um, so that means that we're going to be um, making sure that there is data specific to each community as well as strategies that make sense to address the five core issues in those places. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this in the coming months as those, as those kick off. And then for the next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, you can check out our website at morpsy.org slash RHS um, and everything you need to learn about this work is online. We're going to continue to add more resources to the website over time, uh, including, uh, including a final report which documents the process of the past year. I also want to just highlight um, one resource that you'll find on that web page which is uh, highlighted on the screen here. Um, we have uh, an implementer's toolkit that was designed to be an interactive dashboard that allows users to sort through those over 100 actions based on where or what they want to focus on with regard to housing in the region. And so for the next slide, I just want to shout out to, um, to Jennifer Knoll, uh, who was the, um, the lead from Morpsey on this effort, uh, and she's just a fantastic resource, and I know would be very happy uh, to hear your questions, as would I, um, if either of you would like to follow up with us, and our contact information is there on the screen. Great. Thanks so much, Liz. So we'll be moving into the panel conversation now, and um, joining us will be Carly Booz, and um, Carly is the uh, sorry, um, Executive Director of the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. There she provides leadership and st strategic direction to members, stakeholders, and the local community to expand affordable housing resources. Mm -hmm. um, Carly, we're, we're glad to have you. And if you will, please kick us off by telling us um, more about the Alliance and um, how it came to be. I can, I think you asked, and I apologize, my audio cut out there, to talk about the Alliance for a bit. And let me start by saying thank you so much for inviting us today. Uh, it's an honor to be up here with all these folks. Uh, the Affordable Housing Alliance is a nonprofit organization. We're an advocacy-focused organization, uh, and we are member-based. So we've got 21 members right now. And we really try and curate a, a really diverse perspective of housing professionals. So everybody has affordable housing as one of their primary day-to-day um, -day tasks, um, but that includes everybody from the housing counselors and the advocates to the property managers, developers, financiers, um, and funders and the philanthropic community. Um, and we like that. We're also very data-oriented by, by having that really kind of diverse group of, of housing guys. We're able to come up with these solutions that, that have worked through all of the caveats. We've, we've been able to see through um, all of the challenges and had, you know, a set of eyes that can work their own. So it's a really killer organization. Shameless plug, visit our website. You'll love us. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, let's kick it off with some questions for the, the group. Um, this, we had a lot of information um, and region, regional was included. Um, what's the value 
to um, undertaking this effort as a regional initiative. It seems like just from a, a data and um, just vastness standpoint, going uh, more local would have been quicker and easier. What's the importance of the, the approach, uh, the regional approach? Liz, you're on mute, just so, okay. <laughs> yeah, and um, any of you can chime in and I'd, I'd welcome multiple responses to the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll just kick it off if you don't mind, Liz. And um, I would just, you know, you know, we shop regionally, we work regionally, we drive regionally. Housing is a regional problem, right? I mean, all of these things are contributing to where we're working and where we're living. Um, how much our housing costs is, how, is also contributing to how much our transportation costs are and how much time we're spending in traffic. Um, you know, so I, I do think that's a big part of it. But the other part is, and the reason why the submarkets that we put together were so interesting is that we can really learn, one jurisdiction can really learn from another jurisdiction, right? So if they're seeing that they're having similar issues, what are they doing that was palatable in their um, jurisdiction? And really just try to get that peer exchange working within just our region, which is is you would think is a little bit easier than normal, but it's really not, you know, um, a lot of times just people don't have the information that they need to be able to start those conversations. So. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. My, from my data nerd perspective, um, I like to think about this question in terms of like any sort of intensive data driven undertaking. Um, you really start to see uh, in compelling ways the way that slicing and dicing the data can tell you all kinds of new and nuanced stories that you wouldn't see if you just looked at the big picture. Um, and so, like, for instance, if we just looked at the surface of the trends in the region leading up to the pandemic, we can almost see kind of a rosy story for central Ohio and housing. Like overall housing prices in the region have been increasing, but so too has average household income. Um, so that means that we've also seen a decrease in the percent of people paying too much every month on housing. Um, so if we stop right there, then we can say like, hey, we're good, housing problem solved. Maybe we don't need to go any further. But as soon as you start to dig a little deeper, you start to see that that's not really true for every, in every circumstance. Um, like we know that there are still over 200,000 households in the region that are housing cost burdened and over 100,000 of those are spending more than half of their entire incomes on housing costs alone. And we also know that we've seen a greater number of low income households that are in housing that they can't afford. Um, so just as a way to kind of illustrate how like important it is then to look across, look at the data across those jurisdictional boundaries, because as soon as we start looking at um, the housing, housing issues, uh, comparing one community to the next, uh, we realize that looking at them on their own doesn't tell the complete story. And so the regional perspective allows us to ask tough questions like, where are there um, places that afford the greatest access to opportunity that might have too few housing options for uh, people at all income levels? Or how is the tight market for mid-priced housing options region-wide accelerating investment in low-cost neighborhoods? And what can we do to prevent the displacement of the residents who are currently living there? Um, so housing, just like uh, Marissa said, and uh, is like transportation or sustainability, it's an issue that reaches across those jurisdictional boundaries. And that's why this regional approach is just so important. And Liz, just to add, sorry, just to add, um, the average Atlanta family spends 60%, 62% of their income on housing and transportation costs. So that is how tied they are to like where we're living and where we're working that I think is just makes the case. And, you know, a lot of times that we're doing these um, studies, the housing studies within our local jurisdictions, the question is, where are these people working? If they're not working in our jurisdiction or in our community, where are they working? So, and what, are, what is that community providing that we're not providing? Or for the employer, the question is, why are our employees not living where, we're, where we are? And what is it that we're missing or need to be able to provide to our employees to be able to live closer to where they're working? And the next question there is, why are our employees turning over so often? Why is there habitual lateness? Why is there lower productivity? Because that's what happens from that condition. Um, I think that we could see that, right, in our mm -hmm. virtual experiences that we are getting now. Yeah. I was just going to add, too, that I think 
one of the challenges of not approaching this from a regional perspective is that you then create deniability problems. And that's where you start to see NIMBY originate is people are saying, not in my backyard. And part of that is because my backyard doesn't have a problem. And if you don't have the data and you don't have that information, and you're not engaging every aspect of that community, there's just these blinders and they don't realize that yes, for us, this is a Reynoldsburg problem, it's a Grove City problem, it is um, a Licking County problem. It, it might look different based on those submarkets, but there's nobody in the region who is in a healthy, safe, and sound spot. So if you do it piecemeal, you're gonna lose that dynamic. Thank you. Um, I know coming from my, my prior position as a, a regional organization, we found that um, that was one of the reasons that we were experiencing more success than some of our competitors because we had collaboration, we had cooperation, and it resulted in efficiencies as well. So when you've got finite resources, there is a lot to be gained by working um, on it from a, a regional level rather than within each single jurisdiction. So thanks so much. All great points. Um, so, Carly, I'm going to go back to you, actually, and ask, during this process, um, were there tools that were uncovered that you found to be particularly exciting for the region? Yes, um, lots of them. <laughs> I, I would, I think this piggybacks so well in the last conversation because the power of data and the power of understanding and quantifying the problem is in and of itself just a huge win, even if it stopped there that would make the strategy so successful um, because it's a motivator. I also think that as an industry, housing in particular, and I, I certainly won't ascribe to, to economic development, but housing in particular, we create distance between planners and policymakers and the people who live the results of what we do as in an, a professional world. And we try and say, well, housing is so complex. Don't don't worry your pretty little head about it. It's just so complex, we'll take care of that. And what the strategy did is it completely democratized that data. It made it accessible, it made it understandable for everybody. Like whether you're, you're somebody who works this all day, every day, or you just pick up the website off the street and tune right in. Um, I think from a, a really tangible perspective, something that came out of the survey that was a mind boggle for me that there was a, a complete perspective switch where I went from one way to another was just the phrase a green tape mentality that we're going to stop coming at this from a red tape bureaucracy um, this is the way we've always done it kind of uh, a way um, and say that doesn't have to be it there's we can just start from scratch and we can say yes as much as humanly possible um, I saw Carly. I saw that recommendation on there, and I hadn't seen it before. I love it. I totally want to see everything that's involved in that conversation. Yep. Be able to take that to Atlanta. That's great. So, um, Liz, I am going to challenge you. You made a comment that you're a data nerd. I think in today's society and uh, just where we are with technology, the data science is now the rock star. You know, you're the superpower. So. Well, you're gonna to have to drop the nerd thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a, it's a proud title. <laughs> All right, very good. So um, to, to Liz and Marissa, um, how are each of uh, your organizations or your regional collaborations measuring success? Yeah, I'll start, start us off this time. I, I think that one thing from kind of a bigger picture perspective is replicability. Um, and I think that we learned so much from Atlanta. We learned so much from other regions who have done similar studies like this. Um, and I think that both uh, Morpsey and ERC have been successful in uh, developing housing strategies that can be replicated in other regions across the country. And we really hope that they are. Um, and I think that that is, you know, outside of our specific in our region, what is a measure of success, um, knowing that the process um, can be picked up by another region elsewhere is a really important part of the work that we do. Um, they, it's become the norm for more seed projects to um, make sure that our process includes um, um, some intentional convening of multiple sectors with sometimes competing interests. And uh, we, we think that it should be the standard for any initiative like this with regional and multi-sector implications. Um, so that's kind of like the, the high level 
thing, um, but more on the grounds. Uh, what we're doing right now as our next step uh, at MORPC is working on getting some buy-in around some key metrics, really high level, like what are the hard hitting, like if this metric, if we're looking at this over time, what is this going to tell us about whether we've been successful? How can we make sure that this metric is tied to something meaningful about changes happening on the ground um, that can uh, let us know if we are uh, making progress toward addressing the core issues that were identified. Um, and so as we develop those metrics, MORPC is committing to tracking our region and community's progress across that, and then also continuing to develop tools that will make those visible uh, and democratized, uh, as, as Carly mentioned. Um, and um, so similar to like the implementer's toolkit, continuing to build those resources that we know uh, will give collaborators, collaborators a transparent view of how we're moving toward addressing those housing challenges. Right. Okay. So I'll add on to that. We are also doing the very much the data piece of it where we are trying to vet what are the performance measures, what are the data pieces, um, what are the green to red kind of indicators that we're going to be tracking over the next XYZ years to figure out if we're making progress under each of our very large fact, uh, like broad factors that we, similar to you, that you have five, we have six. Um, so we are doing that on the ground as well and but you know the one thing that i would say that is for me just like the most immediate measure of success and our intention with the just starting this process was we wanted to provide leadership and we wanted to start discussions in the region um and we're really seeing that jurisdictions communities that didn't talk about housing before are talking about housing and they're using our data and our framework as an as their way of having political will to have those conversations so instead of saying like this is what you know ex planner in you know the community says this is what the regional organization is saying is happening in our region and starting with that data conversation even though i could argue that sometimes the data makes the conversation worse and really you just have to go into what are the issues that people care about right um whatever in um but that, that to me, we have three communities that we're doing housing studies for, in-depth housing studies for this as, right now as we speak, that two of them, I would say, would never have talked about housing before this um, information was provided. So that makes me really happy. And, you know, we'll go more in depth with the, the performance measures, but those are the things that are happening, the conversations that are happening that are really important to actually moving the political will and the dial on these conversations. Yeah, I would say um, more voices and um, harmony and, and the talking points is definitely a success. Congrats on that. Thank you. So Carly, um, how has the strategy adapted to the COVID pandemic and how has it stayed relevant? So uh, relevancy is, I think, the easier part of that to answer. Um, and this is I don't think anybody wants to, to find confirmation in their work through a global pandemic, but if there's anything that completely justifies the need for the regional housing strategy and the need for immediate action on affordable housing, it's this moment. Um, and I know that, that Jennifer um, has talked about the 100,000 households, and, and Liz has as well, who in the region are on the brink. They're paying more than half of their income towards housing costs. And we've known forever that that's not sustainable. And if you've got 100,000 folks who are sitting on the ledge of the cliff, just a little rumble in the earth is going to send them all off. Um, and we didn't have a little rumble. We had a freaking earthquake and it shoved them off. And that is terrible for those families. And it is terrible for our regional economy and terrible for our state and national economy. So I think that as we're talking about what COVID means and how it adapts to this um, strategy that we've already got in place. It is the kick in the behind that we need to say when we're talking recovery, we're not talking about a way to go back to 2019. We're not talking about a return to what the status quo was. We need to use this as the push towards actual sustainable growth and housing um, housing stock, availability, programmatic, and everything. I also think that that is, it is absolutely impossible to have that rebuilding conversation without putting racial justice and equity in the forefront and making that the framework around which we build recovery. Um, and the, the toolkit that Morpsey has put together 
There are so many pieces that are just completely innovative and forward thinking that will speak to all of those issues. Um, so yes, adaptable um, pressing, all of it. Great, thank you. And I, I just wanna add, I applaud you all, I, you know, looking at your um, strategies that you guys identified as your five like kind of main goals. I really applaud you for going further than I think that we did within the um, equity space. I think we are now uh, actually um, adding to to the that context and um, have the political will around us to do so. And I'm really excited about being able to start having more in-depth conversations about how racial equity plays into or inequity plays into our, our housing um, solutions and issues. Um, so congratulations on doing that. And, and I would also say just like uh, Morpsey, ARC had housing stability as one of our main goals that we were working towards. It, at, I think I would have said before this pandemic, it probably wasn't the main priority and now it just is the priority, right? Um, so we have some solutions that are already set out and we have new ones that we're innovating and creating just around this pandemic. So I'm, like, I'm so sorry, Patty. Do you mind if I add one quick thing to the COVID-19 question? <laughs> Um, so just thinking about um, like how the key challenges that suddenly we're facing like a magnitude that we've never seen before of housing instability. Um, but I just want to make sure quickly to highlight that like there's also this opportunity to innovate like never before. And you know, as Carly said, you never want to say like um, that there's some positive to this like really devastating thing that's happening right now. Um, but at the same time, um, like there's this opportunity to see political will be behind trying things um, that would have never before been on the table just because the issue is simply too big to ignore right now. Um, so I think that's just an important thing to highlight, accentuate, um, where can we look for opportunities to kind of uh, get behind that momentum and move things forward in ways that we might not have seen pre previously. And if I can carry this on and extend the COVID-19 topic a little further, when you talk about those opportunities and kind of the precursor moments and what we need to do now to get to a place where we can kind of build out that that solution framework i think and i hesitate to say this because anytime you get a bunch of housing folks in a room together like the old joke is that nobody ever talks about housing you just talk about like social determinants of health or transit infrastructure um so i hesitate to go off topic slightly but the digital divide is one of those foundational challenges that for us to be able to access the power of all of those other things, we need to solve that concurrently. Mm -hmm. Again, COVID-19 and racial equity are both putting a huge spotlight on that issue right now. So as um, using our data platform and our framework, we ARC has been able to join with the chamber um, and some, and two other organizations, I think United Way for Health and um, another organization that I'm forgetting right now, but we are using our data platform to create an eviction tracker and where we can really identify people on the ground who need help. And we're using our leadership role within the housing field to um, partner with organizations like the Metro Chamber to um, generate resources to work towards um, eviction relief. So we're excited about how we've been able to take our um, framework that we've created and really just use that as a, a jumping off point for responding to the eviction crisis. So it does seem that um, our forced remote uh, work has created the opportunity to perhaps um, make those jurisdictional boundaries a little less obvious and so much greater opportunity for collaboration. So uh, maybe there's a blessing there. Um. Go ahead. I don't know if it's made it obvious or not. I actually would say that it probably made it more obvious. And I think one of the things that uh, Carly just said is that digital divide, right? We have uh, a number of neighborhoods and communities within our region that don't have the resources that other um, communities do and they're struggling. Right, good point. And I know there's some efforts underway to, to try to address that, but it's a heavy lift, certainly. So um, I think it's now time where we maybe engage our attendees and allow them to pose questions to uh, our presenters and panelists. And so please um, feel free to chime in uh, using your mic or using the chat feature, whichever you would like. And um, anyone have a question? So while we're waiting, 
for folks to chime in. I'm going to actually ask you one that, that struck me. Were there any data points or issues that surfaced as commonalities between the two different regions that surprised you? No? Okay. <laughs> oh, is, is that specifically to me? I, I, um... Well, no, it's to any of you. Okay, Liz, you have a you have a good answer for this one? Yeah, no, I'm trying. I'm trying to think if it's it. It, it strikes me that there is a lot of similarity. Um, yes, perhaps I, more than you expected. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that would be, you know. Yeah, the surprising factor is that there is a lot of similarity, yeah. and and it, it it increases kind of the opportunity then for regions to kind of work across across the country and using these remote options to help us do so. Um, uh, just to continue to kind of learn from each other and keep talking, keep the conversation going. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that just watching your presentation, Liz, I plan on getting on the phone with you <laughs> next week and talking about some of these things a little bit further. So I'm excited to do that. And we've also been reaching out, and Liz has been a part of this, to other um, uh, MPOs who are in the same process. And so just learning all from each other and doing peer exchanges with, together has been really beneficial. Uh, because no matter which way you look at this, there's usually general common themes in this conversation um, to the extent that each of them plague our regions is different and maybe there's one or two things that are a little bit different, but in general, um, you know, it's a national housing crisis and it's not even, we, we could say it's regional, we could say it's local, we, but it is national and maybe even worldwide, I don't know. <laughs> And we're in the weeds on the Atlanta project the way that you guys all certainly are. But just from like today's conversation, I think one of the themes that I personally find really interesting is the way we're approaching engagement. And like, again, like from the housing world, engagement has always meant we're going to have a 630 in the evening meeting in the back of some municipal <laughs> building um, and no one's going to show up and those who do are pretty crotchety. Um, yeah. And like statistically, they're older, they're whiter, and they're more landed than the neighborhoods that they're claiming to serve. Um, but it, it just, and I know from in the, the Greater Columbus way that Morpsey approached this, the outreach and engagement was very intentional and very broad. And it sounds like from Marissa that it was for you as well. And I find that so freaking reassuring. Well, you know, um, I have to say that we have engaged a lot of people, but I, I'm not going to pretend that we're we're reaching the person who is, you know, in a community who's not talking about housing already. Um, I, I, as a MPO, our clients are our local governments, and we want to be able to provide them the tools and the information to have those conversations to the people who are calling them in their communities. Um, so, uh, but you know, one thing we are doing is as we are reframing our goals and our performance measures is we're working with um, Dr. T with the case made um, <laughs> talks about language that you can use that really reaches uh, different perspectives and really forces people to lean in just really reaching them where they are at right so we're, we're trying to talk so that we can give again our local governments the tools and the messaging that they need to be able to reach those people but I am not um, yeah so I'm, I'm proud of that and I'm proud of the 600 X people or whatever that we did reach that are professionals or elected officials or local government staff. And if there were some citizens in there through our housing forums, that's great. But the majority of the people, um, again, we're not the, the, average Amer the average Atlanta citizen. So if you were to, you, you've been through this experience, uh, lessons learned, I'm sure. Um, if you were to give advice to another organization somewhere in the United States who hasn't started down this path, what would you recommend as a first step? Conversation. <laughs> and how do they go about that? Um, you know, like, I, so when we conversation, we, again, identified just very broadly these six factors that we could look to that were really making a difference in our housing. And so we had a framework that was developed that we can start piece of the conversation. And I think
Marissa, hey, Marissa. Like I'm so sorry. I, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> my, point was, <laughs> my point was breaking down the conversation. So, you know, just like we did and just like Morpsy did, if you could find those little nuggets of conversation that make sense to that community, that's where you start. Okay, okay. so we've got a chat question here. Would anyone be able to discuss some outreach strategies you found the most effective for including those who are usually not represented? I think um, one perspective on that, and, and I also see somebody with their hand up, so I want to make sure we get to that question too if there's time. Um, but I, I think some perspective on that is um, uh, that as a regional, from a regional level, it's really hard to get like total comprehensive um, like lived experiences represented in this regional housing strategy. Um, and in fact, COVID-19 kind of uh, delayed or interfered with some of our intentions, which were to convene um, some more in-depth focus groups where we're, we were meeting, not just with representatives of people in the community having different housing experiences or challenges, um, but to have those actual people um, join us for some conversations to hear from them directly uh, what their lived experiences are. So um, I, I think that's our ideal would have been to um, pursue more of that. And so right now the, the approach we're pivoting to is uh, making sure that through our work with our um, local communities and the development of the local housing action agendas, uh, working with them on some strategies for engaging residents in that way, uh, where they are incorporating, um, incorporating those, those diverse voices and lived experiences as part of their um, local housing actions. Um, and also just hearing, hearing Marissa's uh, idea, I'm very excited to learn more about that and just uh, having a focus on inclusive language and communication. Um, that's, that's a really intriguing concept and I think would be something we would love to learn from, from you all. And I, and I would add just like not, not recreating social networks, right? Like the, there's organizations, there's networks that exist that you, you can have these conversations in. So identifying who the organizations are that we're, are working on the ground um, and what the, where, where those spots are that you can interject. Great. And it's not the sexiest thing or it's not the easiest thing for public agencies to talk about, but if you're asking for an hour of somebody's time, you've got to pay them for an hour of their time. I'm getting paid to be here. We are all on payroll, I'm sure. The people that we are asking for their experience and their input from deserve that same respect. Interesting point. So Montre, do you have a question? I do have a question. Good morning, ladies. Um, so yes, my name is Montre. I uh, work for the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. So I'm quite a bit of ways away. However, I think it's absolutely great to kind of get a bird's eye view of your region and some of the things that you guys are working on. And my question is, um, well, let me state it like this. Uh, the area that I work in is a, is a very segregated area, probably the most segregated area in the United States. And the lines between counties and municipalities are very tall and very thick, to say the least. What is some strategies or some conversations that um, we here may employ to get the region to see um, some of the problems that you guys are addressing as regional problems and not solely just as county and city and municipality problems? How do we start to address some of those things as a region um, to bring about those real uh, changes that, that we're needing to see, especially now that we're talking about COVID and, and pulling back the covers and seeing just how bad the situation really is. I think the point that as you guys there are making some, some, some great in runs, I hope to do the same. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a really great question. So important. And um, I think two things, like first of all, I think taking a regional approach is like right off the bat, a great start and um, making sure that the, um, the data is pointed in the right direction, um, right? Like what I was describing earlier about like the, the beauty of data is that if you look at the big picture, it tells a different story than when you start to slice it and dice it. Um, and there, it, it takes some intention and some concerted effort to make sure that you're um, asking the right kinds of questions uh, to kind of uncover some of the equity issues. And, um, one of the really important things that came from this regional housing strategy is that it paints such a clear and compelling and devastating, frankly, story about how 
the patterns of, um, of housing inequity and housing challenges in our region follow the same exact patterns of the redlining maps from decades ago. Um, and so I think uh, by, by building this, this story, this narrative into this cohesive strategy, it's a way to um, make that story reach a broader audience, uh, make sure that it's reaching the ears of the community next door who doesn't have that problem uh, in, their, in their boundaries, but you know that problem affects them too, right? It affects all of us in the region. Um, and so I think it, it really helps to kind of uh, reveal things that otherwise might not be um, so noticeable if it's not right in front of you. Um, and, then, and then just quickly, the other piece is um, continuing conversations with more uh, diverse groups and more groups who have, um, have folks within them who are in positions of leadership and advocacy um, who are willing to kind of represent and speak for um, the perspectives in their communities. And, um, and I think Carly, Carly's point is excellent. Like if, if we're not able to compensate folks for their time, how can we find the next closest thing to um, the groups who um, are having the, the real lived experiences that need to be a part of the conversation in order for us to make actions that are not inadvertently um, kind of putting us in the wrong direction in terms of equity. So I know we're ti our time is up and I just really quickly want to say um, in the chat box, I just posted a really good resource called Piecing It Together by Enterprise Community Partners, who is an amazing partner here to us at the Atlanta region. And I know uh, Liz said the same, but it's called A Framing Playbook for Affordable Housing Advocates. And really the main point is that to elevate the issues, um, we need to build broader understanding of why affordable housing and community development are matters of public, public concern. And it goes into in-depth reason, like in-depth analysis of like how you do that. So I encourage people to, to take a look at that. I hope awesome, Penny doesn't hate me, you. but I would love to weigh in on this too. Um, because I think that that segregation and NIMBY, which is I believe in philosophy an offshoot of that, a lot of that is based around fear. Um, and fear of what your community looks like and fear whether you're going to continue to be accepted in that community. And, I don't think that fear is the wrong motivator, but I do think that people need to start thinking about fear very differently. Um, and one of the things you got to know is that millennial and Gen Z populations do not want to live in segregated communities. And they are, they are speaking with their pocketbook and they are speaking with their feet and they are leaving. So what does that mean for a segregated community for their long-term survival? What happens when you are growing older and not bringing in the tax base you need to sustain yourself because you have made policy choices that are driving people away? I, it's a smaller segment of what, what Liz and Marissa are saying, but there are some people who are gonna to respond to that argument and I think that needs to be very clearly stated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Well, thanks everybody. We are a little past our, our um, end time, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Marissa, Carly, Liz, and Jennifer, thanks so much for putting this together and Morpsey um, and each of your individual organizations for what you're doing on this topic. Uh, wishing you continued success and really hope we'll have the opportunity to work together. Thanks everyone. Thank all. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all. Thanks everyone.